بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله so now we're moving on to Revelation and we're going to be discussing the timeless nature of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the perennial nature of the Quran the fact that the Quran is not transient it's not contingent on time because the language used in the Quran does not represent a 7th century language and the meanings in the Quran can address realities in the 7th century, realities in the 15th century, and realities in the 21st century. And to explain this, I'm going to talk about the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach to the Quran when it comes to natural phenomena. And I'm going to basically deconstruct a relatively new approach to Islam or the Dawah. What I mean by relatively new is that since the 1970s or 80s, there's been an emergence of this kind of movement that wants to show that there are some kind of scientific miracles in the Qur'an. We fundamentally disagree with this approach. Number one, because it's not scholarly. Number two, it's not in line with Usuluddin, Islamic thought, Islamic philosophy. Number three, it's wrong and incoherent. Number five, it commits an epistemological disqualification. You are basically saying divine knowledge is the same as human limited knowledge, which is a huge problem in Islamic thought. And it basically ignores history, misunderstands prophetic tradition and prophetic life, and so many other issues. And that's why we have to deconstruct that approach and reconstruct a very powerful approach that shows that the Qur'an is indeed timeless. Allah uses words and language in the Qur'an that have many layers of meaning. Those layers of meaning can address different understandings across time. And it could address an understanding that we may have that is limited and wrong. But the main purpose of Qur'anic verses are to evoke something within our hearts, souls and mind so we understand that there is a divine wisdom and a divine power permeating the universe so we can conclude that Allah deserves worship. And you're going to see how powerful this approach is when we discuss it at the end of the presentation. Now it's important that we discuss this as well because recently, and what I mean by recently is not the 70s and 80s but the past couple of weeks there have been these videos going around by a YouTube channel called There Is No Clash, I believe. They hired this famous presenter, I think she used to present for ITV, a UK channel, and she's very eloquent and she helped writing the scripts as well. And, you know, she comes across as very professional and it's gone viral. And some of the claims that they made in there are just, in my view, tentative, well, not, not even tentative, the tenuous links between verses and our understanding of contemporary science. And I think it's important that we basically remind each other on why this approach is not a good approach, it's not in line with our theology, and it's incoherent philosophically. What's important as well is not to think that we can't do tadabbur, pondering over the Qur'an when it comes to science and natural phenomena. Of course you can. All we're saying is, you can't make the philosophical leap of faith, if you like, and claim miracle. Because once you do that, you start talking about absolutes and you start talking about things that can never have any naturalistic explanation. But as you will see, the so-called miracles that have been claimed from a scientific perspective concerning the Qur'an can have a naturalistic explanation. That's a summary. But let's basically talk about the background. Well, as you know, since the 1970s, mid-1970s, Dr. Morris Bukayo, he basically wrote a book called The Bible, the Quran and Science. Now this book was translated in many, many different languages. Many languages, right? And many of the callers to Islam memorized the book nearly. I think they memorized more of this book than the Quran, <laughs> some of them, right? It, it just became <coughs> such an important tool in trying to convey the message of Islam to the wider society. And what does this book basically say? It says, the Bible has scientific, scientific errors, the Qur'an doesn't have any scientific errors. That was the kind of conclusion. And as you can tell, it just went viral. 
There was no videos at that time in terms of online, but it went viral. Also, in the 80s, I think the early 80s, you had this commission called the Commission on the Scientific Signs in the Quran and Sunnah, which was run by Sheikh Abdul Majid Az Zindani. And what they did, they invited many scholars from the West, scientists from the West, to come to Arabia to sit in a conference and to basically say, Look, look at these statements in the Quran. It couldn't have come from Muhammad upon whom be peace. It can only have come from some kind of superpower, the divine, because how could, have, how could they have known such information? And this is the information that they attribute to these verses, right? And obviously in the contemporary age, we have the likes of Dr. Zakir Naik and others who basically have promoted this approach to the Quran, which is the scientific miracles in the Quran. However, there's been a growing counter movement ever since the advent of the internet, YouTube, Facebook, Muslims trying to articulate you know, the intellectual validity of Islam and its veracity. They've been using anything they can find, which includes you know, these so-called scientific miracles in the Quran. And there's been a response to the point you have academic journals, like the Journal of Religion and Science, wrote about this. For example, I think this was in 2001 or 2010. The title here is Snakes from Staves, Science, Scriptures and the Supernatural in Maurice Bukeo. And in this article, in this journal and other journals, they called it Bukeilism. It became a, for, a form of ism to try and read you know, scientific facts in Revelation, especially the Book of Allah. So they called it Bukeilism. You have, for example, the Wall Street Journal talking about this. You have popular blogs, you have online YouTubers, all of this stuff, there's, a, there's been a counter-narrative. And I think it's very interesting that when you have counter-narratives, it refines your ideas. And I think that's the powerful nature of allowing in societies that kind of liberty to express one's ideas from an intellectual point of view, because the truth will prevail. And sometimes as Muslims we think, our truth will prevail. Yes, it's true, but sometimes we think we have a truth and it's not really true. I'm not talking about the foundations of Islam, I'm talking about what we, the reasons we think why the Quran is from Allah, those reasons we have, may not be truthful at all. And unfortunately, this is one of them, believing there's some kind of scientific miracles in the Quran. <coughs> so before we deconstruct that approach, let's talk about the kind of articulation that many callers to Islam, you know, how they articulated the Qur'an is from God using the so-called scientific miracles claim. And they do it in three main ways. They basically say, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace did not have access to the scientific knowledge mentioned in the Qur'an, therefore it's from God. Another way it's been articulated is, no one at the time of Revelation, the 7th century, had access to the necessary equipment to understand or verify the scientific knowledge in the Qur'an, therefore it's from God. Another way it's been articulated is as follows, the Quranic verses were revealed at a time where science was primitive and so no human being could have uttered the truths mentioned in the Quran, therefore it is from God. Now there are key issues with this approach, trying to claim that there are scientific miracles in the Quran. It's illogical and we're going to talk about the fallacy that it adopts. It basically dismisses history, even Islamic history. It almost ignores the main purpose of the Quranic verses. It forgets about what we, what we discussed a few days ago with Subur Ahmed, the philosophy of science, the limitations of science, science, science's inductive nature, the fact that science can never lead to certainty. They, they are probabilistic truths. So when we say scientific fact, we don't mean absolutes, we mean probabilities. Also, it has to ignore unscientific verses, right? Our current science, maybe there are, there are some science that cannot be reconciled with an orthodox interpretation of the Qur'an. So why ignore that? And also, it misunderstands Qur'anic exegesis. Okay, how we basically understand the meanings in the Qur'an and, and when we can claim certainties and when we can't claim certainties when we're interpreting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's go, let's go through these. The first one, I've called this the fallacy of the undistributed middle. 
So what is this fallacy? Well, basically a logical fallacy is when something doesn't logically follow. There is no logical link between the premises and the conclusion, in essence. It doesn't logically follow. Now, the science and the Qur'an claim commit the logical fallacy of the undistributed middle. What's the undistributed middle? Well, it's a fallacy where two different things are made the same due to a common ground. Here's the basic structure. Number one, all A's are C's. Number two, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are B's. Now, let's basically give you a really nice example using my dog. or I don't have a dog, but let's assume I have a dog. And oxygen. So, number one. John needs oxygen to survive. Number two, my dog needs oxygen to survive. Number three, therefore John is my dog. Just because there is a common ground which is oxygen, it doesn't mean they're the same thing. You can see how fallacious that is, right? And this is exactly what the so-called scientific miracles in the Qur'an claim does. So let's apply it to the Qur'an. Here's a summary of the logical fallacy concerning the scientific miracles in the Qur'an. Number one, a description of a scientific fact A uses C. Number two, a description in the Qur'an B uses C. Therefore, the description in the Qur'an B is the description of A. Now, this is false. Let's explain this. Let's bring this out. Let's use embryology as an example. Number one, the scientific fact in embryology is the implantation of the blastocyst in the uterine wall implantation can be attributed as a safe place. Number two, the Qur'an uses the words Qararin Makin, which can mean a safe place. Number three, therefore the Qur'an is describing the scientific fact of the implantation of the blastocyst. Well, this is not true because you have ulama like Ibn Kathir, the exegete of, of the Qur'an, the one who explained the Qur'an. He basically says this just means the womb in general. And there's nothing miraculous here because you can see this with the naked eye. The baby is safe in the womb. The safe place is the womb. Now you may argue, yes, but it can mean implantation in the uterine wall because that's a safe place too. Maybe, but you could never claim miracle. You could only claim miracle if that would be the only conclusion you can have. If there's an alternative conclusion that is more naturalistic, that can be explained naturalistically, then you can't claim miracle anymore. Khalas, it's gone. Another example, the Earth's atmosphere. There is a scientific fact that the Earth's atmosphere helps destroy meteorites as they approach Earth, filter harmful light rays, protects against the cold temperatures of space, and its Van Allen belt acts like a shield against harmful radiation. The Earth's atmosphere can be attributed as a protective roof. Number two, the Quran uses the words saqfan mahfuzan, which mean a protective roof. Number three, Therefore, the Qur'an is describing the function of the Earth's atmosphere. Again, it doesn't logically follow. Especially when you see other interpretations of these words in the Qur'an, it doesn't refer to the Earth's atmosphere. So the point here is, although this may be a valid interpretation from a pondering point of view, you can't claim miracle because there is a basic naturalistic explanation, an alternative interpretation that is more in line with our naturalistic understanding of the world. So that's why it doesn't logically follow that is the only conclusion. And to claim, look, it's a miracle because that's what it really means, you would have to show that it's, it's the only meaning that it has. And you can't do that, especially if you have... 1% knowledge of how to understand the Qur'an. You just can't do that. When it comes to these type of ambig ambiguous verses, you could say it may mean. You can't say it definitely means, especially if you don't have a prophetic tradition to explain it, especially when you don't have other verses in the Qur'an to explain it, especially when you don't have the Sahaba to explain it. You have to rely on the language, right? And then when you go to the language, the classical dictionaries, you have many layers of meaning. So that's the first issue. Let's go to the second issue, which I think for me is far more damning, right? And it was, when I was studying this, it really upset me, yeah? Because for me, I felt this was a lack of ihsan, a lack of excellence in the da'wah, meaning in how to convey Islam to the wider societies. So we just picked anything without thinking about it, right? And frankly, there's no excuse. You know, I, 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 I used to adopt this, and it was a big mistake as well. But I have to admit, there is no excuse. You know, when it comes to buying a house, when it comes to doing our PhDs and our postgrads, we're very meticulous, right? 
But when it comes to the religion of Islam, the religion of God, you know, Allah's deen, Allah's way of life, it's like we pick anything without thinking about it. And this for me, I think, was exposing maybe an underlying spiritual issue we had, right? We just wanted to prove people wrong. We didn't want Islam to be internalized in our hearts, though we could express it as something very powerful and compassionate to the wider society. It was just more of a game. I'm right, you're wrong, right? And as you know, conveying Islam is not about that. So in accurate history, there are two things we would say from a historical perspective to justify the scientific miracles in the Qur'an. The first thing we would say would be, the knowledge implied by the Qur'anic verses was not available or discovered at the time of revelation, which is the 7th century. Number two, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace could not have had access to the knowledge implied by the Qur'anic verses. Both of these statements are absolutely wrong. They're wrong. They're they're totally wrong, right? And when I was reading this, I was like, how could we miss this? How could, how could many of the you know, big callers to Islam miss this? I just didn't understand. So the first one, let's deal with the first one. The knowledge implied by the Quranic verses was not available or discovered at the time of revelation, which is the 7th century. This is wrong. Let's take some of the so-called miracles. The sending down of iron. Allah says in the Qur'an in chapter 57 verse 25, and we sent down iron. Okay, the Qur'an says that it was sent down. And this is in line with some scientific understanding that iron ore can be found in meteorites that came from outer space. So it was sent down, literally. Oh, it's a miracle. Well, not really. It's only a miracle based upon your false assumption of history, thinking no one else knew. But the Egyptians knew 1400 years before revelation, they would call iron ba en pet, iron from heaven. So the thing is, when someone who's a skeptic is looking at this, like, well, the claim that you made is not coherent or accurate because it's based on a false historical assumption. Other people did know. What about the moon being a borrowed light? Allah says in the Quran in chapter 10, verse 5, it is He who made the sun a shining light and, they, and a, a, the moon. And a moon, a derived light, Nuran, right? The moon, a derived light. We're like, oh, you know, the moon doesn't have its own light. No one knew at that time, which is false. But what's interesting as well, Allah describes His own light as Nur ala Nur, right? Are you saying God's light is a broad light? Na'udhu Billah, you can't say that. Do you see my point? You have to be consistent linguistically. Anyway, the point here is 1200 years before Quranic revelation, which is around 500 BC, the Greek Thales, he said the moon is lighted from the sun. Another Greek, Anaxagoras, in the similar period, he said the moon does not have its own light, but the light from the sun. So we can't make claims that no one else knew, right? And if someone wants to be clever, they would say, well, the Quran doesn't even say that the moon's light is from the sun. These Greek guides said it though, which is what you would maybe consider more accurate. So we have to be very consistent and, and very intelligent and very classical when we, when we talk about these issues. We might need to have the right methodology that would make sense from an aqli and intellectual point of view and even from a theological point of view. What about the mountains having roots? Oh, the mountains have roots, the, they, they, they mention this now. By the way, which is true, I have a geology book that was published in 2012 I believe. Or, or a bit later, it's relatively up-to-date science, there's a subtitle in a chapter saying, do mountains have roots? And they say mountains have roots, that was their opinion. But the point here is, the Quran says in chapter 78, verse six, six to seven, verses 6 to 7, have we not made the earth as a wide expanse and the mountains as pegs? Allah doesn't use the word root in the Quran, He uses pegs, which is slightly different and it's more to do with the function, right? maybe of, 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 of the function of mountains. But putting that aside, what's interesting, the Bible in Jonah 2.6 uses a Hebrew poetic phrase, which is a poetic phrase to mean extremity or root. So the point is, it existed in other places too. What about the Big Bang? This for me is even worse. You know, we don't even study the science. We, and we discussed this a few days ago in the philosophy of science, where, you know, we, we look at popular magazines, the Big Bang, bro, it's a fact. That's why I'm putting it into the Qur'an, or I'm trying to use it to prove the Qur'an, because the Big Bang is a fact, bro. That's why we're dismissing evolution, because it's just a theory. Which, by the way, work from theories are facts in science. Yeah, but put that aside. You know, the Big Bang's a fact. Oh, really? The Big Bang... 
there is some empirical data and there are 17 different models that explain the same data. This is called underdetermination. And each of these models that explain the same data have the same weight, if you like. And they're challenging each other. So which one are you choosing? Right? So we, 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 we really have to focus on this and understand that you know, we can't pick and choose. And if you want to compare the Big Bang Theory with the Darwinian Mechanism, the Darwinian Mechanism is more well confirmed than the Big Bang Theory from a philosophical perspective. So why, cho why choose one and not the other? This shows a huge inconsistency and a contradiction in the methodology. So the Quran says in chapter 21 verse 30, have not those who disbelieved known that the heavens and the earth were one piece and then we parted them. No one knew this before bro, we just discovered the Big Bang, you know, just a few decades ago. Hold on a second. You have Sumerian literature, which I believe is like five to 6,000 years old, <coughs> in the Epic of, of Gilgamesh. It basically says when the heavens had been separated from the earth, when the earth had been delimited from the heavens, when the fame of mankind had been established. Very similar kind of theme and concepts here. Now, important note, we are not saying the Quran or the Prophet ﷺ borrowed knowledge. We're not saying this. All we're saying is if you're going to make a claim about the Book of Allah, it has to be watertight as best as possible. It has to be based on not only a classical robust methodology that's in line with your intellect, common sense if you like, but it's also philosophically robust and it's in line with our theology. That's what we're saying. And we're going to basically, you know, develop another, well not another approach, it's a classical approach to show that the timeless approach to the Qur'an, the multi-level, the multi-layered model to the Qur'an, it's, it's just phenomenal. It shows how the Qur'an transcends time, which is amazing. And we're going to show this in a few moments. So, so, so actually using the weakness of this to make something else, which is stronger. So this is, these are all multi-layered, multi-level versions. You can understand them in different ways. Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that, inshallah. So, the other historical false assumption that we use is, the Prophet ﷺ could not have had access to the knowledge implied by the Qur'anic verses. Absolutely wrong! <coughs> There is a hadith, a prophetic tradition in Sahih Muslim, in an authentic tradition, as narrated by Muslim. He said, I intended to prohibit the cohabitation with the suckling women, breastfeeding women, and I, could, and I considered the Romans and Persians, and saw that they suckled the children, and this thing, cohabiting with the, with the women who are breastfeeding, does not do any harm to the women. This is authentic narration. The Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ looked into other civilizations, the Persians and Romans, to derive an understanding of the science at the time to see if it harmed anybody. This is a beautiful tradition because it teaches us that we could go to other civilizations and learn and share knowledge. But you can't now claim he could have never had access to knowledge. Really? But this tradition says that he had access to some knowledge. Not only this, if you study Islamic history, Mecca was a trading place. Many people would come from and go to China, India, get spices and leather and all of these things. They didn't go with a fast jet. They would take months or years to get there. What do you think they did? They vowed like two years of silence <laughs> and you know, vowed not to interact with anybody. There was going to be inevitable cross-cultural Fertilization, if you like, different ideas being shared. Even the Islamic historian Ira M. Lapidus, uh, in his book The History of Islamic Societies, he says by the mid 6th century, as heir to Petra and Palmyra, Mecca became one of the important caravan cities of the Middle East. The Meccans carried spices, leather, drugs, clothes, and slaves, which had come from Africa or the Far East to Syria, and returned money, weapons, cereals, and wine to Arabia. There was cross-cultural fertilization. People exchanging ideas, which was obvious, right? Even the concept of the miswak and the concept of cupping, these, these things are Babylonian or, 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 or Chinese, respectively. Yeah? The third point we need to understand is this whole narrative of scientific miracles in the Qur'an misunderstand the main purpose of Qur'anic verses. Remember, the main purpose of Qur'anic verses that allude to natural phenomena, they are there to awaken something within you to understand that Allah deserves worship. They're not there to give you details. If you look at the linguistic structure of these verses, they are ambiguous. 
They get you to see, there are, they are indicators, they are signs for you to observe in the real world, even with the naked eye. And regardless of your limited understanding, it would, you would still conclude Allah deserves worship because there is a power and wisdom behind the universe. It's simple as that. That's the main purpose of these verses. It has a spiritual, metaphysical component. Not one that will say to you, hey, look at the details behind the embryo. No, because it's, the details are lacking. It's there to show you, here are some signs. Whatever knowledge you have, even if you're from the 7th century or the 21st century, even if it's accurate or inaccurate, you will still conclude something all the time, which is there is a divine wisdom and power, therefore Allah deserves worship, therefore God deserves worship. The fourth issue is, and I'm not going to go into this too much, because you understand already, we discussed this a few days ago, about the philosophy of science, the problem of induction, I think you discussed holism, epistemic holism, I think you discussed you know, falsified theories can be revived if you change the auxiliary assumptions. The point here is, if you study the philosophy of science, there's no such thing as 100% absolute truth. Things can change. You can have a future observation or another observation that can be at odds with your generalizations that were based upon limited observations. You're never going to have infinite knowledge, right? So, and that's the beauty of science. It's supposed to be progressing and evolving from that point of view. And that's why Jalis Rahman, a, cardi- a cardiology fellow at Indiana, Indiana University School of Medicine, he summarizes this. He says, One danger of such attempts to correlate modern science with the Qur'an is that it makes a linkage between the perennial wisdom, the timeless wisdom and truth of the Qur'an, and with the transient, time-bound ideas of modern science. And I think this quote is just perfectly summarizes the situation here. And we know why. Science does not claim certainty or 100% truth, and we discussed the problem of induction and the philosophy behind it a few days ago. Science is dynamic and always changes, and science is not the only way to render truth about the world and reality, which we discussed a few days ago. Number five, another issue is, well, why are you ignoring unscientific verses? Take, for example, the Darwinian mechanism. The Darwinian mechanism is one of the most well-confirmed theories in science. So why do you choose lesser well-confirmed theories in science, like the Big Bang, to prove Quranic miracles, scientific miracles, but you're rejecting something that even scientifically is more well-confirmed, which is the Darwinian mechanism? And if you follow an orthodox understanding of the verses of the Qur'an, there's an incompatibility between the Darwinian mechanism and the Qur'an because of the issue of common ancestry. It, there's an ijma, there is a consensus that many of the ulama say that there was no pre-evolutionary forerunner for Adam. So we have a problem here, or for human, the human race, there's a problem here. Now I'm not here to discuss the nitty-gritty science and the theology, I'm just saying Generally speaking, why pick a lesser confirmed theory to prove scientific miracles and reject a more well confirmed theory from a scientific point of view? This is a methodological disaster and it's a contradiction. And this is why we can't claim miracle because we have to understand, you know, when you claim miracle, you, 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 you have to show that there is no naturalistic explanation. But when you look at these verses, there are possible naturalistic explanations. Because the definition of a miracle is, I can't explain this naturalistically. I have exhausted all reasonable attempts to explain that there is a naturalistic explanation behind this. But we can't claim miracle in this instance because there are naturalistic explanations that we've just seen, right? And that's why in order for a verse in the Qur'an to be a scientific miracle, it would mean that the meaning attributed to the verse is definitive and absolute, and there is no naturalistic explanation for it being there. And you just can't do that. And that's why the general rule in Usul tafsir in the kind of science of exegesis in Islam in the Qur'an, is that No one can claim that there is an absolute meaning unless there is a prophetic tradition that explicitly states so, unless that there is some kind of scholarly consensus amongst the companions of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. In absence of this, all you have to do is rely on the language. And if you rely on the language, if you go to pre-Islamic poetry for example, it's ambiguous. You have many layers of meaning. Yes, there may be a primary meaning and a secondary meaning, but what makes you choose one over the other? Do you see? So all you can say when it comes to natural phenomena in the Qur'an, 
All you can say is, not that this means X, but rather it may mean X. So I'm not saying you can't do tadabbur, because our tradition is full of uh, tafsir al-ilmi, the, the, the exegesis of, 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 of scientific knowledge. But it wasn't done to show miraculousness, it was done to show this is our limited scientific knowledge we have at the time, and the Qur'an may be referring to this, and Allah knows best. But the minute you do that, it becomes tadabbur, it becomes a pondering, it's no longer miraculous. Do you see? So, what's the new approach? Well, the new approach, is, I think, is, is this phenomenal. It's based on certain principles. The first principle is that the Qur'an is a book for different levels of understanding. It gives us words to describe natural phenomena, and these words have different levels of meaning that can be addressed across different times, that can, that can basically relate to different times and different understandings of natural phenomena. The words themselves are flexible, they have many layers of meaning, not too many layers, there is an orthodox scope, in terms of a, not orthodox, but a classical scope if you like. You know, certain words won't have an infinite number of meanings, but there is a, there is a kind of framework that we understand, that we don't do too much linguistic gymnastics, the classical books are there, the classical dictionaries are there, and we know one word may have 5 to 10 to 50 meanings, right? So. From this point of view, the Qur'an addresses different levels of understanding with the use of words that have many levels of meaning, therefore it basically addresses different mindsets across time. It's a timeless book. Let me give you an example. The Qur'an in chapter 21 verse 33 says, And it is he who created the night and day, and the sun and the moon, and all heavenly bodies are in orbit swimming. Yes, Bahuna. Now this is an interesting word obviously has levels of meaning. One of the meanings is that it's literally swimming. So a 7th century desert Arab could be looking into the ocean of space and it looks at the objects of space like the moon and the sun and, the, and whatever the case may be that they're moving, they're swimming in the ocean of space. This is not a miracle, it's naked eye stuff. But remember the purpose of Quranic verses is when you reflect on things regardless of your li limited understanding, regardless of what level of understanding you have, you're always going to conclude there is a wisdom and a power behind the universe and therefore God deserves worship. That's the point. But interestingly it can also be in line with today's findings the word yasbahuna, for example, um, Mustan Sirmir, a professor of Islamic studies, he says the word yasbahuna to swim or float in the verse that we just spoke about made good sense to the 7th century Arabs observing natural phenomena with the naked eye. It is equally meaningful to us in light of today's scientific understanding. What about the sun's orbit? Because if you go back to this verse, it says the sun and moon are in an orbit. Now, this from a kind of without scratching the surface, seems like a scientific error. Because at the time in the 7th century, they believed the sun went around the earth. But isn't this amazing about the Qur'an? The Qur'an uses words that are ambiguous enough and multi-layered enough to address different understandings across time. So if you were a 7th century Arab thinking the sun goes around the earth, you're still going to say, well, what power does that? What divine wisdom does that? God deserves worship. Even though he's wrong about his scientific understanding. But in the 21st century, although we don't believe the sun goes around the earth, but we do believe the sun has an orbit, it orbits the Milky Way, it takes 226 million years to do so. So it's also correct in light of today's understanding, which is very interesting, which shows there is a meaning that has many layers, there is a word that has many layers of meaning, and it addresses different mindsets. Even if your mindset is unscientific or wrong, Whatever you're going to conclude, you're still going to, whatever you're going to think about, you're still going to conclude that Allah deserves worship because whatever your scientific understanding was, you're still going to realize there is a divine wisdom and power in the universe or behind this thing, therefore He deserves worship. Do you see how powerful this is? It's addressing, it could address a primitive mindset or a mindset that is less primitive, for example. Similarly, you could apply this to expanding universe as well, but let's just move on to more of a case study. Let's use the word alaqa as a case study. Now as you know, alaqa refers to the development of the human in the Qur'an. You find this in Surah Mu'minun, which is chapter 23, I think it's around verse 14, and Allah uses the word alaqa. Alaqa has five major meanings in the classical dictionaries. Number one, 
Blood in a general sense. Number two, a blood clot. Number three, clay that sticks to the hand. Number four, something that clings. Number five, a leech or a worm. These are the five main classical meanings of the word alaqa. Now this is very interesting because we know it was appropriate for the time. Because alaqa can mean a blood clot. This refers to how the developing human embryo is at a certain stage, which it looks like a blood clot. Because if you look at natural abortions, which are called miscarriages, many women have miscarriages, you see it looks like a blood clot. So it's just describing a reality you can see with the naked eye. There's nothing miraculous here. But think about what Allah is trying to say to us. Look at the blood clot. How did you come from this? How were you developed from this? What wisdom and power? What, who created the asbab, the physical causes in the universe in order for you to emerge from this bloody mess, right? And some of us are still a bloody mess, yeah? So the point is, and that even though it's a limited understanding of the science, the power of the Qur'an is it uses words to the right degree of ambiguity that you could insert your own scientific understanding, even if it's inaccurate, but yet you will still conclude that Allah deserves worship. That's the powerful thing about it. Also, there are secondary implications here. Thinking that you're an Allah has a spiritual existential dimension. Look where I came from, I was a bloody mess. That should humble you. Look where I came, look at your origins. That should create a sense of humility because for you to emerge from this blood clot, you were dependent upon an infinite number of variables in order for you to be here today. So that should lower your humility and your so-called sense of self-sufficiency self, uh, and arrogance because you'll understand I was dependent on others and other things and all those things were ultimately dependent on Allah, on God. It's more of a spiritual existential dimension to this. And as you can see, pictures, it looks like blood clot. But it's also appropriate for our time. For example, if you use the meaning a leech or a worm, at around day 20 to 30 in the developing human embryo, it looks like a leech or a worm. Even Dr. Dale Lehman in his book Anatomy Demystified, and he's not a Muslim, he says the embryo looks like a worm. Even the atheist Professor Myers, he wrote in his blog that the, the baby at that stage looks like a worm. <laughs> it's, it's in his blog. It looks more like a worm. So, you know, and we just discovered the microscope in the 15th century and, you know, after its development and usage, then we, we were able to look at the embryo and see that it looks like a leech or a worm, as you can see here, for example. This is not definitive, of course, but, you know, it's an interesting description. And even if you dissect a medicinal leech, it still looks like uh, the embryo itself, even the dissection of a medicinal leech. And this is the sucker of a leech, and this is the embryo before the neural folds close, before neurulation. Now, it, it may have that meaning, we don't know, but isn't it interesting, there's many layers of meaning that address different understandings. What's interesting though, and this is the meaning that I prefer, which is a spiritual and existential meaning, maybe Allah is saying to us, you were just like a leech. Because what, do, what are leeches? Leeches are parasites. They have a parasitical relationship. They drain the resources, don't they? They drain their resources. And so what's very interesting here is, maybe Allah is saying to us, you acted like a leech in your mother's womb. She willingly and willfully gave her resources to you, so be compassionate to her. And you know what's very interesting? Lord Robert Winston, a professor of science and society and, and an emeritus professor of fertility studies, Look what he said, and this was in a documentary. He said, the leech takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it can latch onto. In this case, that's me. As it sucks my blood, it takes from it all that it needs to live. It literally lives off me and the whole of pregnancy is shaped by similar kind of parasitic relationship. Unlike the leech, the developing embryo doesn't suck the maternal blood, but it does raid her blood from the raw materials it needs to grow. From the word go, both leech and embryo are out for themselves. Another aspect is, is maybe these versions that are ambiguous, we may, be, we, we may not be able to find any meaning. And there may be some verses in the Quran that we don't know any meaning, not from the point of a linguistic point of view, but how to get the meaning of the word and correlate it to a natural phenomenon. We may not be able to do that. That maybe could be an encouragement 
to do more science. So that in a way, there's a linguistic qarina, there's a linguistic indication here. You don't know how to attach this meaning to the real world? Keep on doing the science, right? And even God encourages us, Allah encourages us to look into the horizons, right? To progress and to start understanding the world even better. Just like Ibn al-Haytham, who's considered one of the first scientists, according to David C. Limburg, who's a historian of science. And uh, in the biography of Ibn al-Haytham, he basically says, I, am, I developed this method, which is a scientific method, in order for me to find out the will of God, the will of Allah. So, just to summarize, what we have to understand is that philosophically the so-called scientific miracles claim is not robust, it's fallacious, it's based on false historical assumptions, and it's not in line with our classical intellectual tradition. However, a more robust approach that is in line with our theology, our spirituality, is more in line with reason and common sense, and more in line with the understanding of the Qur'an, and it's timeless, it actually represents the Qur'an as the Qur'an, not as some kind of human limited text. Because the minute you compare scientific findings and believe them to be tr absolutely true, and then say that they agree with the Qur'an, then you're doing an epistemological disqualification here, because you're saying both sources of knowledge are of equal value, which is a huge problem, right? Especially when it comes to orthodoxy. So, the, a better approach for the Qur'an is to use a timeless approach. You say, look, Yes, the Qur'an does refer to limited, the Qur'an does have words that refer to natural phenomena and the words that it uses, is, uh, the words that it uses is ambiguous enough for different people across time to insert their limited or progressive or correct scientific knowledge to conclude all the same thing that Allah deserves worship because there is a divine power and wisdom in the universe. Just like the word alaqa, it could refer to very primitive understanding. Even the Greeks knew that there was a that it was a blood clot. Galen, the second century Greek physician, in his book on semen, he used the Greek words sarkoidis and emados, which means a fleshy thing that's filled with blood. Same thing. So it could refer to a primitive. Uh, 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 it, it could relate to a primitive understanding or more advanced understanding. Allah knows best on these issues. But the main purpose of these verses is for them to be ambiguous enough so you can insert your limited knowledge or correct knowledge or progressive knowledge, whatever the case may be, in order for you to conclude the main fundamental purpose of the verses, which is that God deserves worship. The Qur'an is an existential spiritual book, it's not there to give any details. And that's why when you look at the videos like, you know, There Is No Clash and other old videos, the kind of linguistic gymnastics they have to do and the false historical assumptions they have to play with, for example, the Prophet some could have never accessed information, or other civilizations didn't know this, or there's no naturalistic explanation, or this is the only meaning, which is totally false. These false assumptions that they, that they adopt are, are, you know, are wrong. And that's what they have to do in order for the so-called narrative to work. So hopefully this is giving you the right conceptual tools to really understand the Qur'an in this context. And it's important for you guys who are going to go out in Europe and articulate a compassionate and intelligent case for Islam to the wider community. So you could basically readdress this issue because in my view this has been an excuse for many Muslims to leave Islam because they came to the faith because of these issues. And, and frankly it's because we have dismissed our intellectual tradition. You know, we live in the age of YouTube celebrities, video celebrities, someone sounds very smart and we take them seriously. And that goes for me, don't take me seriously. Anything you have here is, is well documented, it's all your references. Do your research yourself. This is not about me or anybody else, just do your own research. Okay, and it's very important because you know, when it comes to the deen of Allah, you know, cup of tea is cup of tea, but when it comes to the deen of Allah, it's, it's a different issue, yeah? So, I feel this is a far more powerful approach and uh, what we'll do, we'll stop for lunch, and after lunch we'll have a long 45 minute discussion just to unravel a little bit more about these issues, okay? So we'll stop now for lunch, I also have a meeting now, so I'll see you straight after lunch and we'll spend 45 minutes on any questions, and uh, we'll, we'll, resume at the, we'll resume at the normal time. After lunch, Salah, prayer? Yes.